Another stop. Pikachu! This is Super Smash Brothers Melee. This really shouldn't be a surprise to you, unless you've never even seen a Nintendo game in your life, or were born in 2012 or later. If you happen to know about Super Smash Brothers Melee, you probably also know it has a very strong and popular grassroots competitive scene, which has been going on for two decades. However, we aren't here to talk about that. Kind of. Instead, we'll be talking about the meta, or at least each character's meta in a simple, possibly generic, historical overview of how their meta started and its history throughout the meta and where that character currently stands in the meta today. That's right. We'll be walking and talking about each and every character's history in the Melee meta, and see how they were viewed back then, today, and if anything at all changed. And with a game like Melee, the meta is constantly evolving. Who knows, maybe in 5 years, everything will be completely different and the top tiers we know of now will just stagger to mid and low tier. That's just how the Melee meta goes. Now on a note. Let me remind you all that I am not an expert or experienced top player. I'm just a silly nerd who likes doing a lot of research on video games, and especially Melee and its meta. Which is why I'll try to be not so subjective about this topic. I appreciate the history of Melee and will try to paint everything in an obvious light, and I know even the most basic competitor probably knows almost all of this stuff. But eh, let me do what I want to do and you can do what you want to do. That way, it all works out. Now, enough with this talking and let's get moving. Now it's about time we get into this with the one and only Fox McCloud. Fox, Fox, Fox. It seems as if this character is always within the game and can never be forgotten. Fox is a character with a long developing meta that has always been viewed as one of the best, and if not, the best character in the entire game. Although he was viewed as a very high potential top tier character, he didn't have the first place S tier like how he always does now. Early Fox players such as Scamp and the one and only Matt DZ, the father of competitive Smash, were either Fox mains or Heavy Fox secondaries. Despite their good placements at his Tournament Go series, they didn't really put much forth the effort into the character, and it wouldn't be until a young team by the name Chillin Dude 829 or Chillin for short started gaining notoriety with his main character Fox. Especially after his top 5 placement had game over while also taking a set off the then King of Smash, Ken. Up Smash. He took advantage of Fox's many good aerial combos and strong usage of Fox's reflector, also known as the Shine, creating new techniques such as wave shining and shine spiking. This new revelation in the Smash community, along with the growing number of Fox players, started to show off some new faces around the time of 2006 and 7 with players such as Mewtwo King, PC Chris, and Korean DJ pushing the character's meta and limitations as much as they could back then. These new advancements in the community would influence their view of the character and help solidify the character to be the number one top tier character in Melee. The growth of the character also cemented the early concept of the 20xx theory, whereas everyone plays Fox at task levels of perfection, albeit obviously removing the task part, Nearly every professional player were a fox main or had a fox secondary, even the five gods. And if you wanted to do good in tournament, you HAD to have knowledge and usage on or against fox. Eventually, over time as the meta progressed, fox, while still a threat in the competitive scene and with an even larger player base, has seen challenges from other character growing metas like Jigglypuff and Mark. His number one spot, while still earning of the title, has been disputed by some few. Overall, Fox is THE character of Smash Melee, and despite more perceived threats from others than ever before, he still manages to stay at the top throughout the years. As time went on, his spacey broski would stay side by side with him. However, due to some recent changes, the next and now considered second best character in the game is the anime virgin swordsman himself, Marth. Marth had always been envisioned to be a top tier even by the start of the meta. 
However, it was unknown how long he would keep his placement as a top tier character. As early on, many saw him as a character that didn't have much techniques to him, more so relying on C-stick spamming and roll abusing, and many believed that he would slowly fall down as the meta would progress because these early beliefs. That would be until Tournament Go 4 when an unknown, rather experienced 17 year old boy who went under the name Ken would show the true potential of Marth. Ken didn't have the advanced techniques or strong knowledge of the game at his hands unlike many other growing players at the time, however, he didn't necessarily need to have them, as his ability to adapt within the battle helped him learn and improved against his opponents. Along with this, he had shared his own Marth techniques at the tournaments he went to, showing off his abilities for Marth spacing combat, his dash dancing mix-ups, and most importantly, chain grabbing. These techniques, along with his improvements over time, gave him a significant advantage over all the other players, only being defeated every once in a blue moon. Despite this, Ken wasn't just the only Marth player, or even good Marth player, as there were many others maining Marth, either fully or as a secondary, whether out of enjoyment or to contest Ken's Marth. Players such as IB and Azin would go off to also show the incredible prowess and potential of Marth, and many viewed him at the time as a top two, or even debatingly, as the best character. As Ken would later retire from competitive Smash along with others, Marth's meta would slightly stagger but would still perform extremely well with up-and-coming strong players in the names of Tai, Pew Pew Yu, Mewtwo King, who was starting to use the character more noticeably than his other mains, and a bit later on Dr. Pee Pee, who would also use the character alongside his Falco. These players would show the strong potential with Mark despite his slow catch-up with the meta itself. However, as time went on and the Mark meta kept struggling, more of these players would start picking up secondaries in order to cover his Mark's more troubling matchups, or primarily use any other viable character. This slow decline within the meta would change on how people viewed Marth, with some saying he had reached peak potential already and that he couldn't go any further besides some few changes. The few data and changes discovered as time went on, however, would help his standing in the competitive scene, and all it took was one player to push the character even further. <laughs> Zane is a dedicated Marth player in Super Smash Bros. Melee and has quickly risen in the ranks in recent times, showing the absolute power of Marth and breaking the once thought limits and weaknesses of Marth. He torments the souls of Spaces and gives top players a run for their money. He is by far the greatest Marth player as of the new era and doesn't seem to be weakening anytime soon. Jigglypuff, or as we'll be calling her Puff, was an average middle tier character at the time of the early Melee meta. Many viewed her as too light, easy to KO, mediocre ground attacks, and poor speed, with the only things going for her being her amazing air mobility and her destructive tool of power known as Rest, which was pretty well known and cemented for its capabilities as a combo ender and early kill move. Puff's meta would rise quickly, however, by players like AOB, Killa Or, Kish Prime, Anden Helsinski, and The King, all of which proved semi-successful at tournaments and helped place Puff as a convincing high tier for most of the early Melee years. AOB and The King would actually produce and upload early tournament and combo videos involving Puff and their potential, which would help spawn and influence a new wave of Puff love in the scene. Mango, who many of you might know, is an amazing and technical Fox and Falco player in Melee and considered one of the best players in the world, ranking above the top fives in global Melee rankings. Well, you might not have- okay. I'm lying. Almost everyone has known this if they ever played or heard of competitive Melee. And that is, back then, Mango had a very amazing puff as a solo main for some time. And along with the up-and-coming Hungrybox, both players would perform amazing spectacles every tournament they went to. From 2007 to 2010, both Mango and Hungrybox would win nearly every major tournament with Puff, solo or using a duel of sorts, and would help gain Puff to reach levels of top tier, reaching at a peak of third on the top tier list. Eventually, around the turn of the decade, Mango dropped Puff in order to focus on Fox and Falco, and from then on, with the exception of some rarity brackets and events like reverse mains, Mango would never go back to Puff in a serious, competitive manner. Hungrybox, on the other hand, would be going through a dark phase in his career, where he would constantly lose to many Fox players and be tormented by a modest pocket character for Puff, Young Link. Although he would win a few tournaments here and there, most of the major ones would end up him falling near or dead last of 5th to 6th place, 
which made many considered him as the worst of the five gods or even a god falling behind. Despite these critiques, Hungrybox would not surrender so easily, and would push himself to become better every step of the way, even leaving his job in order to play Melee full time. He would defeat Armada's young Link, he would win <coughs> the Fox matchup, he would clutch wins at Majors consistently again, and most of all, he would champion into EVO 2016, winning first place while defeating Armada's Fox. He had finally cemented himself as the second best player in the world. However, it wouldn't be long till the nerves of Armada would be shaken, and Hungrybox would be the number one melee player in the world, as of now. Puff has been contested as a top three character yet again, now reaching her third place triumph that she had been trying to reach again for a decade on the newest tier list. And although Hungrybox has faced fierce competition once again, him and his Puff will go down in melee history. Now, we will move on to a character who shares similarities with the number one character, and one who used to be right next to him. Falco, much like Fox, had been viewed as a very potential top tier back in the day. However, he was viewed more as a very defensive character, with usage of his blasters in order to zone out opponents. Many never saw the true potential for Falco's aggressive and extensive combo potential for a while, and he started to fall behind while other top tier metagames at the time were advancing. It wouldn't be until a semi-large melee tournament in Japan with the appearance of a 14-year-old boy who went under the name Bomb Soldier would introduce himself and his playstyle for Falco. Bomb Soldier's Falco had an aggressive playstyle with a strong punish and combo game, something never seen by many top professionals at the time. This, alongside with his extremely high placement at the tournament and takedown with multiple top Japanese players, showed the true potential of Falco, and his playstyle and strategies were picked up by many Falco mates internationally. This resulted in a huge boost in popularity as players such as Dope and yet again PC Chris started winning multiple tournaments along with the character. Although he would have a small dip in popularity for a short while after that, many newcomers rising to the scene would help soar his popularity even more, with players such as Zoo, Lamp Chops, The Shizwiz, and even later on with Mango, Dr. PP, and West Balls of the sort. He gained such a huge popularity and use within the scene to the point where he was considered the second best or even by some few, the best. Falco's player base would grow even further throughout the years, even including online, However, his overall meta has slightly diminished with, yet again, the rise of other characters. Some people still view him as the second best in the game, while a few others see him as low as the fifth best. Whatever the case may be, Falco is still one of the most dominating characters in the meta and is probably the best top tier character for beginners to pick up and use. Sheik was considered the best character in the game, and not just by an early opinionated standard. I mean as in up until at least the peak of early melee around 2006 and 2007. Sheik as a character is very agile and has a lot going for her, especially during the early time when the meta was still progressing and the most advanced techniques were wave dashing and L cancelling. She had quick, fast attacks both on the ground and in the air, she had amazing speed, her combo game was unrivaled for the time, and her punishes were powerful and deadly, especially her grab game, with her down throw being an easy to use chain grab and can net easy stocks against many of the cast. Throughout the earliest start of competitive melee, Reciferous was considered the best Sheik player and best player in the world at the time, taking top 3 in nearly every tournament go besides the last along with a few others. Eventually, after retiring, other players like Die Superfly and Captain Jack would try and take his place in trying to become the best, all while traveling internationally and trying to take out the notorious King of Smash, Ken. Sheik mains would continuously grow throughout the years of the Golden Era with Mewtwo King holding a strong Sheik along with his Marth and Fox, Korean DJ, and even from other countries like top Netherlands player Amsa and Swedish brother Anaeolus. The growing amount of Sheik players could probably attest to why Sheik stayed on top for so long. With a growing, more technical meta processing through, Sheik would very slowly stale and decline. Much like Marth, after the top players of the Golden Era fell through and came the Dark Age, Sheik kept a stale placing of around 3rd and 4th place. Still quite a hold up and a good place for a relative top tier, with also having the results to back it up. However, with the fall of an age comes the rise of a new era, the era of the five gods and the species domination. The metagame was processing faster than what was thought while this was occurring. Sheik wasn't gaining much within her meta. She was still the same old agile rushdown chain grabbing character she was called for back then and despite a few specific techniques along with anything universal, she would stay how she was for most of it. 
only having changes between the playstyles of remains. Along with the earlier mentions of the five gods, only one of the five gods actually played Sheik at a serious competitive level, and even then only using her as a side character along with his marks and whatever pockets and other secondaries he has. God bless Mewtwo King for keeping these two semi-relevant during this era. Although he shouldn't just take the full credit be because despite the slow technical meta of Sheik, she still is quite a popular pickup for newcomers of his competitive scene and still sees use in tournaments with amazing results. Plup is one of the more modern examples who continues to actively play Sheik to this very day as his true main, along with players like Captain Faceroll, Sweetest Delight, and Shroomed, have exemplified that a character that is trailing along the meta slowly can still stay relevant, and although many have had a lower opinion than that of back then, they still view her as a credential top tier who will probably stay in or around the meta. Another fast, strong, punishing character who has also had a deep placement within the scene is Captain Falcon. Captain Falcon, the sick man, the hype character, the living definition of combo. Captain Falcon is defined by many as a very sick, cool, and hype character. With his amazing speed, above average weight, combo potential, tech chase reactions, and many of his moves being either combo starters or powerful hard hitters. Yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. I got numbers on oh. the- oh. One of his most famous hard hitters include the Falcon Punch a Smash original that has been adapted within him in every installment, and the knee. Introduced firstly in Melee. If you are a Melee player and have never been hit by or hit any, then you are either a motherfucking liar, never played the game, or have just gotten into the game and haven't picked him or put him under a CPU in the character select screen. Although the Falcon Punch is a legacy within Smash for Falcon and is considered the definitive of powerful moves, the knee is treated with much more respect in the Melee community, and may even be known more than the Falcon Punch within said community. The move is fast, is an aerial, which makes it easier to maneuver around in the air, it hits really goddamn hard, and most importantly, it's a combo ender. At least for its sweet spot. And if not, then it's most certainly a combo starter with the sour spot. But we are not here to talk about knees. We are here to talk about metas and bitches, and Falcon has quite the lengthy history. In the early Melee meta, Captain Falcon was seen as inferior compared to his Smash 64 counterpart, mostly due to the weaker hit stun not allowing for extremely easy to use zero to death and many move changes that are seemingly inferior. However, even before the meta progressed as where it is now or even then, many knew he had potential if put in the right hands, and not for long, their right hands man would arrive. Isaiah, also known as God, was a very good melee player. He knew a lot of the technicalities of the game and also knew how to put it into his playstyle. He was also a heavy Captain Falcon player in Melee. Combining these abilities would prove a very dominant, savvy, and technical playstyle and also undefeatable. However, Isaiah was defeatable. Quite some in fact, as he never took the game too seriously. He has a habit of sandbagging, trolling, or dicking around in matches. Although still looking as if he were putting up a fight, mostly because, why not? Despite these occurrences, he still plays regularly in top 8 with sometimes Solo Falcon, got Falcon his first ever win at a major, and is one of only a few to take multiple sets off Ken when he did put up a fight. These fights would spark interest between the two, and form the near undefeatable El Chocolate Diablo doubles team. However, that's a different thing for a different time. In conclusion, Falcon was finally seen as a viable character near top tier levels, and he had good representation in the meta with results. And although when the era of the Golden Ages was coming to an end and Isaiah was losing interest in getting more frisky with Melee's predecessor, newcomers would arrive and still show the power and style of Falcon. Players such as Dark Ring, the Solo Falcon, Bobby Scar, the Man with the Plan, and Silent Spectra, the then next top Falcon who would prove himself as such by placing top 8 to 16 with Falcon on a regular basis at Majors, and even taking a totally legit set off of Marta at Pound 4, who we'll get to later. And also was the Green Falcon in the Wombo Combo video. Oh! 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 However, none would reach such peak as Hacks fucking money. Hacks was, considered by many, the next profit for Falcon as he pummeled through the rest of the competition with his extremely technical movement, hype tricks and combos, and his fabulous Falcon. He was loved by all Falcon mains and was seen as the chosen one. However, he wasn't a god, not even close. 
He got whooped by the five gods at almost every tournament, and although he would place top eight consistently, he had stiff competition with other extremely good players who would also regularly place top eight. Despite this, in 2013, he was considered the best of the non-gods, although he believed that he could be even better, as he was a firm believer of the 20xx apocalypse theorem, and never saw Falcon as a potential top tier or even viable to get first at majors. So after his fifth placing at the Big House 3 and a few locals, Hacks would drop Falcon in favor of Fox at the start of the new year 2014. Whether this change was good or bad for Hax is unknown and not of matter in this topic. However, it wouldn't be till long that Falcon would gain yet another profit, three of which are the most notable. None, S2J, and Wizrobe. That isn't to say those are the only good Falcon players. Falcon is a really popular character in Melee due to his learning curve, flashy movement, and of course, combos. So there are many other noteworthy players including Gatsu, Gravy, and even European players such as Dejagov, and J Pi. However, these three would make many appearances throughout tournaments and would be heavily influenced by the optimization of Falcon known as 20GX. All of these players can place top 8 to top 16 consistently at all tournaments to go to, and can reach even higher on some occasions, with Wizrobe in particular winning a major with Solo Falcon at Smash and Splash 5. 14 years since Isaiah's win at most 3. It seems that Falcon has a rather bright future ahead of him. The next character we'll be talking about, however, may not be having one. Peach, also known as Princess Peach, is a featured newcomer in Super Smash Bros. Melee. She has many of her unique abilities stemming from the Super Mario series, most notably from Super Mario Bros. 2 or Super Mario USA. These include her abilities to float and pluck vegetables from the ground, among some of her other moves that reference her more girly yet wild side of her, such as her spinning on the ground with her dress and using an umbrella to recover. Now, this might immediately make you think, wow, okay, she sounds kinda good. Well, sorry, bud, but you are very mistaken. She's not just good, she's strong. Hi, possibly top tier strong. Before there were results, before there was an Amada, before there was even a scene in Europe, America and Japan were the go-to places for early competitive melee involvement on Peach, and by golly, there were some. Even right around the start of the Tournament Go series, Peach was already seen as a top 5 character due to many of her safe abilities along with having an air stall tool available with her allowed her to be played extremely defensively for patent players who can then strike fear into their opponents the moment Peach touches them. Players like Video Gamer, Sass, and Wife put extensive use on Peach in the early meta and innovated the character with such easy techniques like float cancelling and bomber stalling. Don't worry, this character isn't as lame as you think. She could pull out multiple quick aerials with low lag through double jump cancelling and floats unique abilities. She had a destructive down smash to use against crouch cancelers and most importantly, her turnups or her RNG move can pull a vast range of different types of turnups with different types of properties. And if you're lucky, you might not get a turnup, but something else. Something that could change the tides of matches or fuck you over. Later on, more players decided to pick up the character due to her rather low technical skills yet powerful game-changing attacks and her patient playstyle. Players such as Pink Shinobi, Veins, and Iori would prove successful with the character by having average to good results. However, one would come out on top and defy everyone with his speech, showing to the low-tier peasants what you could reach with such a character, and what made it crazier was that he was no American. Armada was already starting to prove his dominance in his own region and continent and was ready to move on to new frontiers. Now, many didn't take him too seriously, just expecting some mediocre European player to get a basic result like top 32 or 16, maybe top 8 with a good record, and just leave back to Europe. But Armada defied everyone's expectations by reaching grand finals at one of the biggest melee tournaments at the time, Genesis, with multiple top American players competing too. By the time the new decade was hitting, Many players began to realize the power and competence that was Armada and his Peach. Many players began to realize the power and competence that was Armada and his Peach. Accompanied by a young Lincoln later on in Fox. But let's not get to that during these discussions, we must focus on one. Armada's Peach was very well rounded overall, but he pushed the defense and offense move Peach could use. He showed the extreme edge guarding tactics and Peach's safe recovery options. His punish game was among the most dangerous, with one grab potentially leading to a stock loss in his amazing positioning, not with just Peach, but overall as a player. He was near perfect with his options and what he wanted to use and had a great mental game, well, until years later, when his overall mental state made the game feel more like a chore for him rather than being overall fun. 
and with the rise of newer players putting possibly more stress onto him, the game was just not fitting with him anymore. In September of 2018, Armada announced his retirement of singles, and thus starting the decline of Peach's meta. Okay, well it's not such a huge decline. Armada had already proven well that Peach is very much a solo viable near top tier character, but the retirement hurt Peach's meta a lot. That doesn't mean we wouldn't be getting more new Peach players, such as Shippu, Kalamatsu, and Laud. But with the rise of characters like Falcon and the top tiers mostly staying in their turf, along with not having a completely dominating Peach kind of harms her meta, and could possibly lead her to lower as more players and characters climb over her. Well, until another Armada comes through. But only the future can tell. What the future can tell is that the next character's meta will vastly change how they play in a few years, and that goes with the high tier duo, Ice Climbers. Ah, the Ice Climbers. A Smash player's favorite, least favorite character. Ever since their debut in Melee, the Ice Climbers have been a staple within the Smash series and are adored by everyone, even when they got removed from that one. No doubt in my mind that the Ice Climbers are seen as great additions to the series, but that doesn't mean they get respected by everyone. Not at all. Originally, Ice Climbers were seen as pretty okay. The duo was definitely unique due to their 2-in-1 game style, along with both representing the Icicle Hammers giving them strong moves overall that can rack heavy damage, and this was basically all about them at that point in time. Yeah, not many knew much about the potential that Ices had. And although players who grinded the character and Nana's AI knew about the possibilities of what they could possibly do, it would take quite a while before they got truly represented as the potential high tiers they are now. One of the earliest dedicated Ice Climber main was Chudat, who is still actively playing to this very day. Now, since nobody knew much about Wobbling and Desyncs were only starting to get noted by Ice Climbers, Chudat had to rely on a patient yet punishing playstyle and of course, his significant- Yeah, yes! which would strike fear through his opponent. These playstyles including wave dashing a lot due to having the second worst traction giving them the second best wave dashing, their floatiness, and of course their punishes off grabs, yes even before wobbling the ice climber still had potent grab punishes. However, as the years slipped by and desyncing became more prominent and the foundation and establishment of wobbling by the neighbors across the river traversed across the world, the Ice Climbers would rise up in the meta to high tiers. More players such as Fly and Manita and Wobbles would introduce the new power of the Ice Climbers by, well, wobbling their way up the ranks and brackets. Although to be fair, Wobbles does do some sick desync setups and kills and shit, but anywho! However, this technique wasn't met with high regards. As the years went on, more and more players and spectators started to grow a heavy dislike towards wobbling, finding the technique cheap and unfair, and many tournaments would start restricting it or outright ban it, including the Apex series, which was a hot spot for the competitive scene. As wobbling was coming to a ban, a sudden event would happen to Melee that would bring it to the rise and give the Ice Wobblers a second chance. EVO 2013 would confirm Super Smash Bros. Melee's entry in July of 2013. Among the hype of what was going on, a rule set was to be followed at the tournament, created by the EVO organizers with little voice from the Melee community. This specific rule set allowed the usage of wobbling. Now, I don't know why the community didn't step in to ask them if they could change it considering their stance at the time, and why they would somehow be okay with this since it's coming from the same organizers that thought best of 5 sets should be regulated to only grand finals but it wouldn't be surprising if they accepted it solely due to the fact that Melee was literally getting a huge revival at the biggest fighting game esports tournament. What's even more appealing is that Wobbles, one of the Ice Climber players mentioned earlier, had his peak performance at this tournament, reaching all the way to second place. Yes, second place at EVO 2013. And not just with a lucky bracket, as he defeated three three of the five gods in attendance, and stayed on winner's side until grand finals where he would lose to Mango. Despite these results and rule set changes showing the over-reliance and abuse of wobbling, these results would show many of the potentials Ices had, wobbling or not, as many would change their stance on the idea of wobbling, and saw it as a benefit for the young climbers. For years on end, more players such as Nintendude, Fahi Bro, Fat Man Spam, Diz Kid, Bananas, and Army would show the power of the Ice Climbers by performing exceedingly well at majors, 
sometimes without using the Fenny Pamu Infinite. However, around the time of Smash Ultimate's release, as spectators continued to grow in size and more people started calling out for so, wobbling had been in some disputed territories on whether it should be banned or not, with more than ever finally leaning more on a ban or limit on it. It's unknown how much the Ice Climbers meta will change from this. Some say not much due to some Ice Climber players still performing well at big tournaments and that many of their other stuff like desync setups can be just as powerful as a wobbling, although requiring actual skill. While others say that this could heavily affect them due to losing one of their most powerful X Factor and could bring them back to early meta tier placements. If you've been watching this section, you might have noticed some preferential bias towards wobbling. And I would like to point out and say that I don't hate the players that wobble. Yes, they're using what I consider to be an extremely cheap tactic that's basically a legal stall tool, but by the end of the day, it's the game to hate, not the players. I understand that most of them do it because it's their best way to win or rank high. It's just... God damn, why do the climbers have this dumb shit? Don't worry, don't worry. Our next character we will be talking about who doesn't have wobbling, well, kind of, is the yellow rat himself, Pikachu. Pikachu was hurt pretty damn hard between the transition from Smash 64 to Melee, losing a lot of his consistent combos, range, and powerful damage racking attacks and specials. However, he did gain some new tools and attributes during the transition, including a better recovery, some extra weight thrown on him, and even though they were hit, his aerials and new throws give him good combo and edge guarding potential with what he has. However, Many people didn't believe these were good enough to bring him to a viable position, thus he was ranked a borderline low tier for most of the meta. There were very few people willing to put the effort into playing the character, and the few good ones that did exist, like Rory, usually had a side main along with the small rat. It would be years to come, past the golden and dark era of Melee before we saw a true Pikachu player rise through the ranks. Axe, a god among non-gods. One of the greatest Pikachu players and the reason why Pikachu is no longer licking off the cafeteria floor. At its start, he was already performing well, getting above top 33 at majors at the time like Genesis and Pound 4. Throughout his early journeys during the era of the Five Gods, he was rising quickly, proving to be successful with what many people thought to be a low tier character, and he would continue this growth throughout the start of the decade. down to his last stop. Is he gonna get it before a minute? Passes? Whoop, well, let's see. He's right near the edge. Oh my god! Destruction! By 2014, Axe was ranked in the top seven on the Melee Global Power Rankings. And although he would slightly drop around 9 or 10, it wouldn't stop his journey with his own character. Even when he had to pick up other secondary forces like Falco and Young Link, he would still put almost all of his dedication into the one thing that made him who he was. He already proved that he could make top 10 with the mouse, that the mouse was itself viable. Now all he had to do was to prove that he could truly win with the mouse, and only the mouse.
Oh, and he even got the reverse tail spike. Axe takes the tournament. Wow. So amazing and consistent by Axe. Axe had done. He had won a major with solo Pikachu. And if that's not enough for you, he would eventually win Smash Summit 8, a tournament with nearly all the top 20 melee players, also soloing Pikachu. Axe had defied everyone by winning a major with Pikachu, and it doesn't seem like his growth will stop there. Who knows what we'll see with Axe when Offline comes back. Heck, who knows what else we'll see from other growing Pikachu players like Bonk Cushy and Okami. But as we know now, Pikachu is a formidable high tier, regardless what your stance is. Another character that has risen through the tier list after being regarded as a non-viable character for years is our next character in review, Yoshi. The changes between Smash 64 and Melee for Yoshi was extremely harmful and hurt the character a lot. With weakened power and damage, nerfed combo tools and changes to his defense options, Yoshi was considered unviable for an entire decade, with very little Yoshi mains outside of pocket uses actually performing well or even decent at tournament level. Although many have noticed some of Yoshi's unique technical abilities, it wouldn't be until later that these would be put into strong use. Around 2012, a Japanese player by the alias Amso would start competing around his local scene in Tokyo with Yoshi and would gain good to even excellent results with the character. In 2013, Amso decided to go international by playing at EVO 2013 getting 25th at the tournament, and creating some buzz around the scene. Not only had they seen a Yoshi place quite high at one of the biggest melee tournaments at the time, something that should probably not even been possible, but by a first time player who had never been to a single US tournament. Many players tried to write this off as a simple fluke or a lucky bracket, and that Amso would slowly decline along with his Yoshi. However, Amso would prove them all wrong. Yoshi for once would finally see a significant rise on the 11th tier list. Along with this, Amso would be more prominent at international tournaments in order to prove his prowess with Yoshi and that he wasn't in unviable low tier. As the years went on, Amso would consistently place higher and higher at tournaments as well as defeat many top professional players. Along with this, Yoshi's tier placement would keep climbing and climbing up until Yoshi would reach 10th place on the current tier list, proving the dominance and true potential the character had finally reached. Unlike with Pikachu, who had won a major and has more players growing in the ranks, Yoshi only has a small yet dedicated player base and has yet to win any international major. Although Amsa has come close, and it wouldn't be unlikely to see it happen in the near future. The next character, who has also came close to winning a major and has a dedicated player base, is Samus, or Samus. Her best placement in the series to this day. With the overall changes going from the transition in Smash 64 to Melee's engine and gameplay to overall buffs in her approach, speed, range, power, combo nature, and survivability. The Bounty Hunter had already started off with a few dedicated mains by the start of the early scene, including Wes, who would frequently get top 8 at most Melee tournaments from 2003 to 2005, and Hugs a growing Samus player who would start getting decent results but wins against some of the top players of the game. By the time the Golden Era was reaching its peak, Hugs dominated through the competition, and his peak performance and the closest thing to Samus winning a national was EVO World 2007, where Hugs would fight through the bracket, defeating many of the top and upcoming players before facing off in grand finals against considered by many to be the best melee player and a favorite among many, and getting second place. Sounds familiar. The point of the matter was, Samus was confirmed to be viably strong and could possibly even win a major. However, everything would change for Samus after the golden era of Melee was over, where innovations and regression in the meta for a lot of other characters would cause Samus to decline throughout the years. Although other players were keeping her at a balance over time like Plup and Duck, and Hugs, who was still going at it with the character, she would be stuck in viability limbo for years on end which is still going on to this day, especially with said mains dropping her for better characters. And although she does have a few decent players, it's unlikely they will be able to achieve any kind of national winning anytime soon. But hey, this is Melee, where a bottom tier character could become a top 10 character in an instant. So who knows, maybe at Apex 2046, Samus will finally get her first ever major victory. But only time will tell for the Space Bounty Hunter. These next two characters are what we consider now as the low highs or high mid tier characters, as they are the last two characters to be considered on the very fringe of potential viability. 
The two characters also have dedicated fan bases that will objectify each other on which one is better than the other, whether it's slightly or by a long shot. However, in point of this video following the recent tier list, we will start off with the character after Samus, Luigi, the younger brother, the second of the bunch, the lean, mean, green machine. Luigi has always been perceived by many as being stuck in the shadows of Mario, as Mario is the one to get all the attention while Luigi sits back, and no game unlike the first two Smash games give this distinct application. For unknown reasons, but possibly time restraints, Luigi reuses a lot of Mario's voice clips, with changes only being to the pitch. He reuses a lot of his moves from Mario's, although they are a lot more distinct than from 64, and even in his trophy description it states that he has always played second fiddle. He's pretty much a Mario in a green cap and a slim body build, but that doesn't mean that they are at all the same. Besides physical shape and fit, along with a slick stash, their attributes and properties are far from each other. Like I mentioned earlier, Luigi uses a new side special called the Green Missile, where he can charge himself up and boost himself forward much like a missile, gaining a good horizontal boost depending how long it charges for. This move may also sporadically explode and go very, very, very far. This has been coined as the Misfire. Among other differences and specials include a powerful sweet spot up special that also goes only vertically rather than directional, fireballs that stay straight and his overall smash attack and aerial moves being much stronger, his power is leagues above that of Mario's. Along with this, he's jumpier, floatier, and has subspar speed and traction, which we'll get to in a bit. With all these tools, he was seen as extremely easy to use and viable in the extremely early meta of competitive Smash Melee, along with the foundation of wave dashing, which due to Luigi's low, low traction, being the lowest in the game, allows him to have a long, fast wave dash that at full max can go halfway across to final destination. Luigi had quite powerful and unique options, however he does have downsides. Since he had weak air and ground speed, his approach options were rather weak and having a weak recovery despite being a higher jumper and having two moves that grant good use of vertical and horizontal distance. Despite these flaws, he was ranked high in the early meta with players like Adam, Viss, and Kula. However, halfway through the golden age of Melee, he would fall low as more characters would develop while the plumbers, being simple all-around characters, would not gain such development. Although Luigi does have some trick up his sleeves that not only come from himself, but from the game, because despite being basically mid-tier from here on, Luigi would still have his very unique moments. Along with this, his player base never dropped or died down, as he still has dedicated players in the name of Kamaster, Jaw Raiden, who by the way is a fucking goaded Swiss who has whooped some of the top 100 players and make top European players his second fiddle, Eddie Mexico, Blaze Yellow, Vidusian, Boulevard, and Abate. These guys can get Luigi into top 8, although inconsistently, and can sometimes make their opponents play by their rules. Hell, even non-Luigi players can still play Luigi and get good results, like Pluck, who got this tarred into top fucking 5 at a big tournament with no other character. <laughs> like, how the fuck? Currently, the viability of Luigi is unclear, with many stating that he is around the last of viable characters in the meta, while others saying he's the first of characters that are unviable and could possibly never win a major. Now me being the biased asshole, I'm going to share my regards towards that statement in which I do have some optimism with the little dude. I mean, considering this man's shoes are made out of wet country crock butter, can turn into a warhead at any given time and defies the laws of physics, he can probably pull some sneaky bullshit and somehow, possibly somehow, win. But that's very unlikely or at least not viably possible for the time being. But just like Melee, Luigi can pull about anything out of his ass and do spectacles with it, even if it means rigging the system by doing absolutely nothing. Now, of course, not everything can just be broken, otherwise nothing would be able to heal, which is why we need a doctor in the house. No need to pull out the apples, because Dr. Mario is here for your daily dose of fixing those high tiers and showing them their place. Dr. Mario, or Mario but this time doing his basic doctor roleplay, is basically the Smash 64 Luigi of Melee. He is quite literally an exact clone of Mario. All moves, all animations, nearly all attributes and builds is exactly the same, with the only difference being the skins, the neutral special projectile, this time being pills and not a fiery thing, and the properties. Despite being conceived as being a stronger, less combo-ish Mario, he still retains a lot of combo tools within him, 
and along with better power and damage, these can be extremely deadly in the right hands. If you want to play Mario while also having fun and wanting to win, then you best expect to pick up Doc. Although Luigi is right there if you're the typical Despite this, the early meta didn't notice this for a while, as combos were considered more important than a lot of other stuff, and since Mario had the better combo tools and kits, he was perceived as higher than the Doctor. Although they did stay next to each other on the list later on due to their clone status and both gaming in good results, with Doc getting players like Caveman, S. Royale, and most notably, Captain Jack who had a really good Dr. Mario secondary alongside his Sheik. However, no Dr. Mario player would top the power and dedication towards the character than Shroomed. Shroomed Daquan Energy McDaniel was a full-fledged Dr. Mario main in most singles competition he entered. Through 2009 to 2014, Shroomed would compete with Dr. Mario and get top 8 results consistently with the character, wiping the floor with his stellar down smash. Eh? He will continuously defeat some of the best non-gods in the world and even take a few games off of the few gods he faced. His performance at EVO 2013 by placing top 8 with the character made many come to the conclusion that Doc was just that good. He had the amazing edgeguard game against almost all the top and high tiers. He had the prowess that rivaled that of the best non-gods. He had the tools that gave himself the advantage that the plumbers didn't even have. He had everything good for being a high mid-tier character who would eventually retire here by the end of 2013. Reaching 9th place, not bad at all. However, times have changed. Melee was evolving more and more and its top tiers were getting stronger and more technical. While the Doctor did have what he had, he was already pushed of what he could possibly be. Kind of. It was more so that Shrooms was having less fun with the character, as more learned the Doc matchup, more found a way to get around his tools, and when this started happening, Shroom just wasn't having it. He finally decided to take a bite of the apple and would drop Doc dead for what was basically the top tier version of Doc, Sheik. Now since Shrooms was basically the best with the character and had dropped him, the Dr. Mario meta was stuck in limbo for a long while. Although it did have its dedicated player base and whatever few mains remained, they couldn't reach the great results that Shroomed could, and Doc would drop down to a mid tier as characters like Yoshi and even Luigi were rising above him from their current placings and ranks. That was until another doctor came around, by the name of Franz. Although there isn't quite a lot of major results compared to Shroomed, he is looking to throw on the coat for himself, getting good results with Dr. Mario that hasn't been seen since the Shroomed era. And he's rising, making 82nd on the most recent Melee Panda Global rankings. It seems likely that a new doctor may wipe away the bad apples that have been holding him back, but then again, only time will tell. Hopefully, time will be soon though. Now is about time we start reaching down to, in my opinion, the mid-tiers and the start of unviability, at least by my standards. Everyone has different and subjective viewpoints, so we won't go too deep into this, so let's start off with the King of Evil, Ganondorf, the most evil villain within the Nintendo lineup. The King of Darkness, the ruler of Hyrule when he feels so, makes his introduction into Super Smash Bros. Melee, very late into development. But that shouldn't give off any red flags. So, with the mighty evil sitting among the other characters, how would you think he would have been treated? Slamming others with a giant sword? Using magic to play volleyball? Having power and strength beyond even that of the other strong characters? <laughs> nah! Let's just make him super slow yet stronger Falcon clone with very few differences among moves. Yes, a very unfortunate occurrence for the Defining King of Darkness, however trying to make a next gen game within 13 months isn't exactly easy, especially when trying to come up with moves for characters during your last month in development. We're even lucky he got in in the first place, as the only quality that allowed him so was having a build similar to that of Captain Falcon's. Now to put that out of the way, the game is out. People are curious and start putting time heavily into the game. Yada yada, Ganon is considered a high mid tier character as he has weight, power, and damage written all over him. He also has good chain grabbing abilities against some of the casts and a bit of range for his type. However, he has flaws that are more noticeable, including speed and also range. Once he gets hit, he's nothing but a volleyball in open air. His weight along with his air mobility and speed allows him to be toyed around within the air and much like Falcon, he can be easily edge guarded. Despite this, he was still ranked higher than him during that time. He also had good players that would prove the power of the King of Darkness, including Linguini, Rockcroc, and Eddie, who would actually get very good results at MLG tournaments 
and fifth place at EVO 2007, holy shit. Despite the end of the golden era and the rise of the five gods, Ganon would actually keep a steady balance on the tier list, usually ranging between 10th to 12th, and this was probably due in fact to even more players picking him up. I mean, he's the evil lord of the Zelda games. Plus, he looks badass. Who wouldn't at least use him once? New players like Chad, Bizarro Flame, and Kage, who would gain notoriety for absolutely bodying Mango, considered by many as the best player in the world at the time, at Revival of Melee 2, twice. As the meta dragged on, more players became more experienced with the game, their characters, and against Ganondorf. This resulted in Ganon players having a harder time reaching higher places, and some either gaining a secondary to cover bad matchups or just dropping him entirely for a new character. The character's meta has declined ever so slightly, now reaching 14th and usually sticking around that spot, acting as some sort of gatekeeper between viability and unviability. It is unknown how far Ganon will go, or if he will ever reach back up. But for now, Ganon players should be contemptuous with it. I mean, they're getting it easier compared to other Ganondorf mains in the later games. Now it's time we get back to our final and favorite plumber in red, Mario. Mario Mario. The man, the myth, the legends of video games. Much like his video game counterparts, Mario is built to be an all-around average character, so it would make sense that he would be put around an average tier. However, this wasn't always the case. Due to the fact that Mario had a much better combo kit while still thought of retaining similar powers to Dr. Mario, he was placed really high on the first tier list. However, as they went on, reaching his lowest point of 15th nowadays. Despite his similarities to Doc, who is higher than him, he lacks any good kill confirms compared to his Doctor counterpart, and although he has more combos for his cut, barely any of them follow up into a kill finisher, as they are better for damage racking. This, along with his below average range, hurts him far more than it does to the Doc. He does have a slightly better recovery compared to Dr. Mario, however he can still get thrown around and gimped hard offstage. All this combined with his rather weak history in competitive play after Matt Deasy retired and Doc was climbing the ranks really doesn't give the character much history. Yes, he still does have a player base, with his most notable main being an alter ego of another guy, and his best solo main, a rookie, going through some stuff at the moment. Well, at least there's Koopa Troopa. Sheesh. No disrespect towards these guys. They're really trying out here with the famous plumber in red, but unless something occurs with this character that can push him above Luigi's and Doc's ranks, well, there just doesn't seem to be much hope. Maybe Ganon could allow him to pass through if something big were to happen with this character, but that's a long shot scenario, and at this point, I'm just flapping off. Well, at least he got his forward aerial from this game. I guess that's something to take into consideration. Despite his near low tier status, Donkey Kong actually has quite the history in the competitive scene and maintains a good player base for where he is. In spite of his weight and size, Donkey Kong is quick and nimble as he needs to be as he has good ground speed and great air speed. Many of his attacks come out rather quickly and boast good to even excellent range on some of them. This, combined with his excellent grab game, allows him to actually have strong powerful combos and finishers against even the top tiers. So, with all these traits that even some of the high and top tiers can relate and share with, what makes him bad enough to not be ranked higher? Well, for one, his recovery kind of stinks. It gives him pretty good horizontal range, but extremely bad vertical range. And although it gives his arms invincibility during a part of it, he's still easy to hit. And when hit, he's basically out. Another thing is, like most heavies, he's very easy combo food. Especially with an unnecessary hurtbox added onto his tie making it easier to hit him without actually making contact with his body. And along with the fast fall and no good get off me moves when being played around with, this gives him one of the worst disadvantage states in the game. This was heavily noted back in the early days as he would be ranked near bottom 5 for many tier lists up until MLG came around and a man by the name of Bum started playing. Although Bum only played around the New York scene for a short amount of time and played at few tournaments, he made amazing results with a considered unviable character, including getting first at one of the Zenith tournaments and getting top 4 at MLG Long Island 2007 with other high players in attendance, including Mewtwo King, where he nearly threatened to take a game off him. This helped DK shoot highly up in the tier list. In fact, a bit too highly. Despite the small amount of results, Donkey Kong had reached a peak of 13th place by the 9th tier list. However, just like how he rised, he would quickly decline down. Looks like having a small amount of results can only get you where you want for a short amount of time. 
Despite this drop, he would still be used by dedicated players like Fishit, Green Ranger, Mo, and Wrangler, and is even a semi-popular pocket character for some like Rishi and West Balls. Nowadays, he's even more popular due to the nature of Slippy and Melee Online, however, that's not the topic for this video. But who knows, maybe after the whole, this whole schmuck is over, DK can finally get what he deserves. A top 2 placing at a regional tournament. Much like DK, the next character would actually have a contributive role in the meta despite his place, and that character would be the young hero of time, Young Link. Wielding the Kakiri Sword, Deku Shield, and some Lon Lon Milk. Young Link would be thrown into the melee roster as Link's smaller and energetic clone. Unfortunately for Young Link, that meant he also had to be similar in a lot of ways, including having similar tier placements throughout the meta. Unlike Link, however, Young Link would actually have compatibility with a lot of the top players as a favorite pocket character, specifically for the Puff. However, before we can get into that, we gotta go back earlier and mention how he was perceived. Back in the old school days, many had considered him to be a bit inferior compared to Link, and although that might have been due to the fact that there were few Link players and very few Young Link players, it still didn't change the minds of many. As the years came and went, however, and players like Jash and Chudat would give the characters some decent uses, many started to claim that the characters were about roughly equal, or even, that maybe, Young Link, just maybe, might be a bit better than Link. All they would need was more definitive proof, even as a pocket or a one-trick pony, to show that the Young could climb above the experienced. After considering Peach to be unviable for the Puff matchup, Armada had to quickly find a way to shoot down the Puff before it was too late. Eventually, around 2011, months after his defeat at Apex 2010, Armada showed off his floaty destroyer, Young Link, as a way to surprise the Puff. And it worked. You see, one thing Young Link had was good aerial approach, and good aerial mobility overall, unlike his older counterpart. This made him a threat towards floaty characters, including Peach, who he had a good matchup against during the time period. And this also fits together with Jigglypuff too. And since now that the two of the upcoming best gods were floaty mains, it became real obvious who would be more prominent in the meta. For about three years, Armada would cruise through tournaments before using Young Link against Hungrybox, and in almost every encounter, Hungrybox would be pushed down as Armada's Hero of Time would rise up. I mean, you can't really blame Hungrybox. Armada was using an obscure low tier who was only good for a few specific matchups. What did he have to practice with or against to learn the matchup? Well, actually, quite some, because, like, I mean, how much was the story gonna go? Eventually, Hungrybox started understanding the matchup and ways to counter it. So eventually, Armada dropped Young Link and started using Fox, and the rest is history. However, that doesn't mean that was the end, because despite so, people would still use him as a pocket character for floaties, including Axe, who would use him against other Puff and Peach players, and although there has been a debate more recently on which Link is slightly better than the other, Young Link will still have a small role in the history of the melee competitive scene. Now, let us wait five years. Uh-huh. Uh, all right. Yep. And there he is. Link. After going through a whole game being absolute shit, you know that you would have to be buffed going into the next game, right? Well, yeah, kinda. He gained several new kill confirms, his recovery is not absolute dog shit and he's just not really shit but still not as comparable to other good recoveries. Good mobility on both the ground and the in the air compared to then, even though he's still slow compared to everyone else in the new game. He has good dish joints and has strong tech chase options, especially off his grab. He's also got a good edge guard game, including with his large amounts of projectiles in his kit and with his notorious up special semi spike in neutral air which lasts longer than the average human lifespan. However, he's a heavyweight and a fast baller, so he's pretty easy to combo and chain grab. He has bad end lag on a lot of his moves, including some of his aerials. Another thing is that due to this new melee engine, among other physics issues and rush changes, Link is a very glitchy boy. <sighs> Link during the early competitive scene was seen as superior due to Azin, who at the time was considered one of the best players, used Link on occasion in tournaments. Later on, players like the German Aniki would also help Link's meta by doing decently well at regionals and majors with the Hero of Time. Then Armada came around with Young Link and everyone basically forgot about Link for the time period between 2011 to 2014. Now this doesn't mean there still weren't players during that time period. I mean come on, if Pichu could have players then so could the Hero of Time. Dan Salvado, Six, Stro, and J666 were playing out of their minds with this character, whether to keep his meta relevant against the Yinkers or to try and prove that Link was better than Young Link. Their efforts 
I actually kind of succeeded, especially after Armada stopped using Young Link. Debates between the two characters are pretty common now due to seemingly always new discoveries with Link and seeing slight more usage compared to his younger counterpart nowadays, especially with the great minds of Kuya, Safe State, and Aklo. For now, it is unknown who is the better one, but much like the newcomer in the experience, they'll probably still be hugging each other very closely. Hey, you know how I mentioned Kuya? You know the guy who just mains Link? Well, you're wrong, because he also mains the next character we'll be talking about. Mr. Game and Watch. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't think of a clever transition for this one. Catch me a break. In the early competitive meta, nobody really played Mr. Game and Watch. His flaws were noticed very quickly when the game was released. Bad approach, very lightweight, horrible defense game, possibly being the worst of all the characters, and susceptible to various KO setups. Although many had noted his powerful K options and setups he himself had, and a good recovery, it still wasn't enough for him to reach the powers of the third dimension. With the exception of Dire on Fire, who also used other considered low tiers in tournaments, there wasn't a single decent Game & Watch main out there. Somehow, during the turn of the decade, more players started trying out more of the lower tiered characters to see what potential they had and how far they could go with them. And no other character got this treatment like Game & Watch. Much like Amso with Yoshi and Axe with Pikachu, Curve would step in and be THE Game & Watch player for everyone to see. Curb's Game Watch was leagues above what people thought could be for the Flatman, and he would get semi-decent results for a character that places regularly in low to near bottom tier, while also ticking off sets and games against good players. Even Hungrybox got a game taken off from the destructive Flatman. In recent years, due to his ease of access and usage, Mr. Game Watch has had a growing player base, still small but more than from other low tier characters. And many have questioned his potential once again, especially in a more floaty dominant meta, players like Forest, Kuya, and Glock and My Toyota, what a sick ass name, have gotten great results with the character nowadays than from what was seen years ago. Hell, even Curve got an honorable mention on the 2019 Melee Panda Global Rankings, which with all of these, has slightly helped Gaming Watch's meta to now be a worthy description among the community. Regardless, aren't we all just glad to see our favorite 2D man has made it this far? Of course we are. Now, we finally move on to the real low tiers. The characters that don't have a lot of history between them and are only notable for one or two players in the entire history of the melee competitive scene. This is where stuff starts getting smaller in size and length, so you have to excuse me on these ones, but I will try my damnest to at least show that they are a part of the scene in a way. Mewtwo was not left easy during the start of the competitive scene. He was considered by many to be the worst character in the entire game, ranking at the absolute bottom on the first tier list and staying at bottom 3 until the 10th tier list, nearly a whole decade since the scene started. So what was the reason for this? Well, for starters, his flaws, which are still noted to this day and the main reason why he'll possibly never make it out of low tier. He's big looking, however is extremely lightweight and along with having some of the dumbest hurtboxes on a character, the whole thing is basically a failure at this point. But wait, there's more! He has average range on a lot of his moves, he has few KO moves, and the ones he does have are very tight to land. He has a poor ground defense game and shit tech abilities, and two of his specials are basically unusable in a serious tournament setting. Sounds like a shit character, and you'd be right. However, he does have some uses, otherwise he wouldn't be where he is today. For one, he has quite literally the best recovery in the game, even when not using it to its fullest potential. He has a good approach style and can combo hard. His throws are either extremely powerful or good combo starters. He is really good in the air, being floaty and all that with a lot of good aerials for use and some good options like air dodges and double joke cancel are helpful and his final special, Shadow Ball, is one of the more better projectiles in the game, even when not fully charged. Despite these, the flaws were much more notable and nobody even dared to use the character in a competitive setting. We would have to wait years and an era before finally getting someone who knew what he was playing with. Taj, the real Mewtwo King, the creator of Shadow of Claw, the reason why Mewtwo even got out from the bottom tier. He would start placing well at tournaments alongside Marth. Some of the time, however, he would use Mewtwo more as a priority over Marth, and would sometimes just go solo. One of the times he went solo Mewtwo was at Apex 2010 and got his greatest placement with Mewtwo and Mewtwo's highest placement at a major at 17th place, 
which was phenomenal for a character still considered bottom three. By this point, the backroom mods couldn't let it pass them, and they had to make sure Mewtwo would move up higher than usual. And they accomplished this on the 10th tier list. Now, does this mean Mewtwo was going to break out of his low tier shell and become a top 5 character and that Tash was going to be the Amsa or Axe of Mewtwo? Well, no, his flaws are still a huge issue in his design and gameplay, and more players have adapted over the matchup. Nonetheless, he still receives players like Leffen and Prof, who uses Mewtwo as a good pocket character while showing hard representation when they use him. And dedicated players like Zama and. Nebi? Wait, when the fuck did this happen? Did, did, did I miss something? Hold on, I, I, I thought he made, I, I thought, wait, I thought he made the blue Yoshi, wait, what? Anyways, that's the best you're getting out of Mewtwo. Could he rise? I don't know. Could he drop? I don't know. Does our next character work much similar to Mewtwo with having range yet very little kill power? Eh, probably not. But let's get a move on anyways. Being the clone of Marth, Roy is essentially a clone of Marth. Yeah, yeah, give me the plug now, give his trade-off is that, unlike Marth, he has fire for his attacks. However, he's shit now. That probably wasn't much of an explanation for you at all, especially given its status. There's a lot more issues with the character than explained. For one, his tipper hitboxes are now on the center or hand of the sword, meaning he has to get within closer range in order to truly hit his opponents hard. He has a really hard time killing, with there really only being three moves that can kill quick and responsibly. He has a weak recovery, although it grants more horizontal distance than Marth, along with being light, meaning he gets edge guarded and killed earlier than usual. And finally, most of his moves are extremely laggy and difficult to combo with. So we're essentially dealing with a Bowser ranged Marth who can't hurt a fly and uses a melted popsicle stick as a weaponry. Well, at least he has a good approach game and... Yeah, that, that's really all he has. But that hasn't stopped people from using him. Even back in the day, few players would pick up and use him since he was a clone of Mars, so the similarities weren't that far apart. One of these players would go by the name of Neo. Neo is by far the greatest Roy player ever conceived by man. Y'all think Zane winning with Roy online was cool? This motherfucker was placing consistent top 6 at nationals, offline with solo Roy most of the time. His Roy was so fucking nutty that Ken, the king of Smash Melee, said it was like fighting against himself whenever he went up against Neo. He also got into Grand Finals twice with the character, both at MLG Chicago 2005 and the first Pound Tournament, where he would narrowly lose to Ken in an intense set for the championship and would lose to Chu that also at Pound. And this would probably be the final time Roy would ever have a chance of winning a national. Essentially, Roy was living the dream pretty damn well. He seemed to be on the come up and Neo dropped melee for Brawl. Sucks to suck. Now this is kind of where his whole story ends at this point. Yes, some top players do use him, but either out of pocket or to sandbag, and his best players, like Sethlon and Voth, are all but active. His meta has barely developed and shown more of his flaws than any improvements each time he's played by a top player, and unlike online, it's really doubting if Roy will ever reach levels of Neo again, especially since the meta is a lot, and I mean a lot less scrubby than it was a decade and a half ago. Well, either way, at least in our hearts, Roy's our boy. HA! This one honestly kind of surprised me considering I wouldn't have ever expected this character to reach this high, like ever. But I guess when Mewtwo King lobbies to you for a decade, you eventually just have to succumb to it once. All you need to know is Pichu is a weaker, inferior, shittier version of Pikachu, which was most likely intentionally planned based on his trophy description. Another thing the trophy description describes are his advantages, being quick, nimble, and difficult to hit. And by this statement, I say they're 100% right. Those are really his only advantages. The other stuff he has going for him is... Recoil damage? What the hell, Sakurai? Yeah, okay, recoil damage isn't the worst thing in the world for characters to have. It makes your game plan revolve around being more careful. But you would think, you would think that Sakurai would at least give him something that'll at least benefit the little guy for having such a bad gimmick that essentially gives him a disadvantage when being in neutral or advantage state. Usually, in exchange for this gimmick, they would have stronger power overall or be able to combo like hell, 
which Pichu kind of does have. He can chain grab fast fallers, and he does have kill power on some of his tools. However, they are all generally weaker than Pikachu's, and since Pichu is a small character with small range, his hitboxes are also small, which means they're easier to SDI out of, and harder to do jack shit! Oh, did I forget to mention the range? His range is bottom of the barrel. You literally always have to be right next to the opponent to get even a few lucky hits, which automatically puts him in a disadvantage state regardless of what situation he is in. And his endurance is really bad due to his feather weight being the lightest of everyone, which also means a lot more hits done, meaning he can get knocked out pretty early at the speed of light. All this leads to having one of the worst total matchups in the game and being forgotten for basically fuck all of the beginning of the competitive scene. Besides being used by the names of Korean DJ and Chuda as a lulzy pocket character, this character had nothing going at all. No recorded dedicated players, no good or even semi-decent tournament planes, no tier placements out of bottom three. So how? How the hell did this character somehow make it this high? Well, if we throw away the whole lobbying conspiracy, our second best guess is Mewtwo King's small performances with the character. Mewtwo King has always thought of his character as severely underrated, and to prove how good this character is, at least by low tier standards, he would use him sometimes in serious competitive matches, and would win sometimes with the character. Although he had possibly been using the character as early as his times playing competitive melee, he wouldn't use him more frequently until around 2014 where he would use him whether as an alternative to sweet pools or to just be disrespectful or, fra or flashy. Which I guess these results were so worthy he's now finally out of bottom 3 into bottom 5. Or maybe we can look at the picture within the bigger picture. Meet Chaos aka Andrew, the slept on god of Pichu, or should I say, Super Pichu. You see, it had been speculated that his spirit had possessed the soul of Andrew, giving him unrecognized power in playing Melee. The problem? It was only when he played Pichu with the blue goggles on port 4. Very specific, but this power was to give him a chance of light, and that he would become the best of the best not only with the character, but in his local scene, and then maybe, the world. Through the power of the spirit within him, he gave the kid complete power that could be transferred from the controller to the console that helped aid him, along with using a special technological file card in order to give him good luck. This allowed him to show the real potential of Pichu and the unnoticed powers and tricks that were hiding behind him that we, a scene that has extensively researched thoroughly about each character's stage mode and letters on the naming screen, had never figured out before. Throughout 2016, Chaos had effectively dominated his local scene and would have possibly made a come up in the competitive scene with his abilities. Unfortunately, claiming you have possessed spirits inside you is considered a John under the Melee administration, and that good luck technological pieces of bites under a solid file was just a cheat card to buff his character. So in reality, his powers didn't directly communicate through the controller into the console and more so directed onto the mouse to the Crazy Hand application. He was indefinitely banned, but it may have given a solid understanding to the BG backrooms that, hey, maybe this character ain't half dog shit. Who knows what the real reason is? There's so many theories to this, but all seem to relatively be the right reason. It doesn't matter now since Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is out and Pichu is a high tier in that game, so if you want to play Pichu seriously and you're not M2K, well, the offer is right there for you for the steep price of $60. GG Sakurai Ness fucking sucks. What else do I have to say? Ness didn't always fucking suck though. He used to just suck a bit back then as although he was a billion times worse than his Japanese 64 counterpart, and a bit worse than his American 64 counterpart, he had great throws and aerials, which combined with DJC basically turns him into an Atari breakout board. He had a high recovery, although easily gimpable, and although having a bad ground game, he does have some weak trash game, giving him a pretty good wave dash. What sucks about him, like literally most of the characters in low and bottom tier, is again, bad approaches and lack of range as most of his good moves are short range and small, making them hard to hit, and the moves that do have good range, like his projectiles and smash attacks, are either really ass or are a bat. 
He can somewhat fix this with the use of the yo-yo glitch, which basically stretches a glitched hitbox to nest when performing an action no matter how far away, but it's not the easiest thing to pull off and trying to set it up alone is an unforgiving challenge. But when you do get it, it's pretty goaded. Another factor is the fact that he is a below average weight, and along with a gimpable recovery, well there's no point in trying to recover. Again, despite having no dedicated players, Ness was ranked around mid to low mid tier when he got dedicated players by the name of Quaz and Simnot Ibn Sind. Then that's when he started dropping down. <laughs> uh, gotta love the early melee meta. Simnot Ibn Sind and later on Mofo would actually gain semi decent results and close upsets with the young boy. With Simna getting 13th at EVO 2007, and Mofo being known as that one Ness main embarrassing young hacks and nearly defeating him. Both would also be known for their, their discoveries of the yo-yo glitch and its special properties like the jackets and deadline. Nowadays, there's barely any Ness representation besides Hungrybox when he's not being Hungrybox and... These guys. Wow. Ness main's got some dope ass names. No wonder everyone cheers for them when they come around. As of the 10th melee tier list, Ness has been sporting the number 20 tier e behind his back and unless something happens, he'll always be sporting that beautiful odd number. Which is kind of funny considering his neutral aerial dropped from 39 frames of NLAG to 23 frames during the transition between 64 to melee. I am definitely not reaching here at all. Finally, we reach our last low tier, the Princess of Hyrule. Zelda. Contrary to popular belief, that woman on the character select screen is not a glitch placeholder for Sheik. That woman is an actual playable character that goes under the name Zelda, in which she is actually Sheik disguised as a low tier character. Back then, before the times of shine spiking and shuffles, Zelda was a top 6, 100% viable character in Melee. Or is she? Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of good reasons why she was ranked so high on the first tier list, and it had been speculated that the forum's moderators at the time considered her placement to be when both Zelda and Sheik were played simultaneously as a group pair, rather than being independent. By the time the third tier list came around, she was dropped down to the 20th spot, a 14 spot drop. Besides Sheik main switching to Zelda for flashy end kills via back or forward air, this character has had zero dedicated mains from start to now. Not even the lake although he does use Zelda much more frequently than many other Zelda mains. Realistically, there's no hope for this character, so you Zelda players might as well give up hope on trying to bring her back to top 6 levels and move on... Well... Actually... Uh, you know what? Keep the spirits up, y'all. Maybe you do have something to prove. Now, we have moved on to the final characters of the last tier list. F tier! The bottom of the barrel tier. The tier of no chance of viability for anyone stuck within. Once you are in here, you cannot escape. You, as a main of one of these characters, will live forever in horrible pain and burning agony, begging to be released of your horrible misery. Either that, or you're just looking for an easy fun guy or big hard hitter for your favorite stage, Hyrule Temple probably, or if your boy's on a Saturday night. If you played Smash 64 then moved on to Smash Melee after release and were looking into getting into Kirby, you were fucked. All the good traits of Kirby's from Smash 64 are gonzo. No more good air and ground speed or mobility. No more powerful attacks. No more supreme disjointed hitboxes. No more long range. No more shield pressure. And no more quick low lag moves. Kirby is just shit. Really shit. And although he doesn't have a specific defining downside trait like Mr. Game & Watch or Zelda, he's just overall shit. It's very clear that the transition nerfs were intentional, and not just out of bias. Remember, Kirby is supposed to be a character anyone can pick up, so having anyone easily pick up a dumb character that was arguably one of the best in Smash 64 wouldn't have been fair in any kind of way. Besides just being shit, he does have a few saving graces to his character. For one, his tilts are still good both in range and in functionality. His defense option like air dodge, rolling, and shield are well enough to help cover him. 
Two out of four throws are functional, and although noticeably weaker than from Smash 64, he does still have an edge guard game since he has some workable aerials. Also, I just want to mention that despite being shitty and needing to be precise to get the good hits, his smash attacks are still kind of decent. Down smash is just a shitty version of Yoshi's, his forward smash is just a shitty version of Falco and Fox, and his up smash is just shit. Except for that small fox-like sweet spot on his body. So like a character that has overall attributes, him being overall shit kind of still works out. Of course he's shit, but he's still overall. Not gonna help in a meta like this, even in the early days. The only people who put in the effort for Kirby were Timmy, who would publish the competitive Kirby guide on early Smash boards, and Crazy Kirby Kid, who got good results at his locals and regionals, and did fine at the few majors he attended, even getting ninth at Moist 3. Later on during the turn of the decade, there were actually some few dedicated Kirby mains throwing themselves out there. Players like Serial Rabbit, who took a set off a hammered armada, props to that though, Omni Gamer, Hack, and the most notable one, Triple R, due to the fact that he had taken games and sets off some notable players and plays considerably well for Kirby. I have no idea what was the reason for this sudden growth, especially for a character this trash. However, my theory is that they saw that the backroom had thrown Kirby at dead last and wanted to prove something for Kirby that shows he isn't complete trash and just almost complete trash. As the Kirby and Bowser tier placement argument had been starting going around at that point of their peak plays. And since the best Bowser player had essentially stopped using him later on, they all decided to stop using Kirby. Proving that they had outclassed them, and by then, many top players had agreed that, yeah, he's bottom two and not bottom one. So congrats Kirby fans if that was your motto. If not, then, I don't know, good job still? Kirby mains have been long gone in the scene since then with the only semi-notable Kirby main at the moment, Captain Pretzel. Well, at least they still have a player base, even if it is one guy. Like, who nowadays actually dedicates their time to maining Bowser? Bowser, the worst of the worst. A character so ass, there are literally no active notable Bowser mains at the moment. Well, actually, there is this one guy named Skeleton who plays Bowser and likes to comment a lot. These jokes are getting kind of old. Anyways, let me run by this quick. Bowser has always been unanimously considered one of the worst characters in Melee, and may possibly be one of the worst in Smash overall. All he has going for him is being strong. He has excellent KO options on a lot of his moves, and has powerful attacks overall. He also has an amazing out of shield option in the form of his grounded up special, and he also has a good ledge game below 100%. What he has in flaw, however, is his horrendous overall speed, very slow mobility, below average air speed, the slowest walking speed, shit jump squat, being as high as 8 frames and overall heavy lag on a lot of his moves. Bowser has one of the worst neutral games in the meta, as any pressure he tries to put in the opponent would simply fire back easily, and although he does have his ledge get up attack, it's only available for a limited time and can be shut down by many of the opponent's options when done correctly. Finally, his survival rate is extremely low, because despite being a decent faller and being the heaviest character in the game, he can still get KO'd pretty quickly, especially after a good combo due to his large size making him a large target that's easy to land a hit on. And the moment Bowser is thrown into hit stun, he's going to be in hit stun for a long while until the opponent messes up or Bowser is touching the blast zone. His recovery, fast and giving decent horizontal boost, is completely unusable for vertical lift, and if an opponent were to grab the ledge, no matter what, he will never make it onto the stage. Reminder, these are just the majorly bad flaws. Bowser has so much flaws, it's not even funny. Just an overall statement is, he's terrible. And although he's more functioning than someone like Zelda and Kirby, at least those characters have something that helps them in out in a way like Kirby's decently average edgeguarding game in tilt, and Zelda's three tools, dash attack, forward air, and back air. Despite his very bad placement and lost potential, some players did play him back in the day, including the main three, Chaotic, Magnum, and Gimpy Fish, along with Arash. They would play semi-decent results with Bowser, solo or dual maining him. Then came DJ Nintendo, who had a strong Bowser secondary, in which he would use to upset many notable players and even win some locals with said character. Finally, our story ends with Warrior Knight, 
It would start using Bowser more frequently after DJ Nintendo's slow drop-off of Melee Bowser to look after his other mains and secondaries, in which Warrior Knight would perform similar feats by doing good with Bowser. However, he would eventually retire from the game, and now we enter the timeline of no current notable Bowser mains at the time of writing and publishing this video. Hopefully. Obviously, I don't doubt that another Bowser main could come around and do some tricks and stuff, but DJ Nintendo and Warrior Knight had basically reached and presented Bowser's human potential in a competitive play. This is peak Bowser. Unfortunately for that, the peak was just the base camp for everyone else. You know, I think this says a lot about Melee. The tier list is simply the mountain peak for the characters to climb up to. All are different in their own way and try to reach that peak in their own style, even if it requires some of the toughest, trickiest, and undefined traits to do so. Some make it up there easily, while others take forever to make it even halfway through. While doing so, the mountain is changing incredibly in size and length rapidly, showing no point in finality even above the peak. It truly is wondrous and stands as an allegory towards the deep understanding of the melee meta. That's all that had to be said. This meta is constantly evolving beyond our understanding, and it truly amazes me to see how far this game will go. I love the competitive scene for Super Smash Bros. Melee, and although you don't have to, you gotta at least have something in ya that says, damn, this is kinda neat, or cool, or interesting, or even goaded, whatever or whichever your thoughtful mind comes up with.